Uh, hello, welcome. Um, with this, what I want to do is talk about the substitution and income effects. Uh, in two previous problems of like utility maximization with budget lines and the difference curves, I kind of went through them, but I don't, you know, the the example questions from Krugman Wells, I kind of went through them. However, uh, I don't think I clearly um, kind of talked about the difference between the substitution and the income effect and what we're talking about with those. So uh, with this problem, there's a video that's kind of building on those, and I'll put a link to those other solutions um, to other problems just so you know what I'm kind of building off of. But with this video what I want to focus on is a substitution and income effect and we're to, to talk about that we're going to go through an example and kind of talk about exactly well what is what do you mean by uh, substitution and income effect. Well when we talk about the substitution and the income effect uh, what we're talking about is the effect of a change in price. So the idea is that um, anytime you change a price you're gonna kind of change your consumption of that good. Uh, most, you know, uh, practically everyone has a downward sloping demand curve. So if uh, the price of some product or good or service or anything like that goes up, uh, the quantity demanded of that thing is probably gonna be going down uh, for the vast majority of goods and services out there. Um, so obviously if a price changes, there's gonna be some change in your demand for that. However, um, given some kind of price change, you're actually affecting income as well. So the idea is that if, let's say, the prices of tons of goods and services go down all of a sudden, you know, these types of goods and services that account for a large portion of your income, if they all go down, the idea is that you are, in real terms, richer. In real terms, you have more income. When economists talk about real or in real terms, they're talking about adjusting for prices. So, for example, real GDP is gross domestic product adjusted for prices. So when we talk about prices of all these goods and services that account for a large portion of your income, if those go down, in a real sense, your income has gone up um, because you know you have the same amount of money, but you have more purchasing power if prices have gone down. You're able to buy more things uh, for the, with the same amount of money because uh, prices of those things have gone down. So in a real sense, you're richer. So when we see, uh, so we, you know, the this too good economy that we've been dealing with, uh, that you deal with in uh, intro to duck, intro to econ, um, most textbooks deals with, you know, too good economy. Uh, when we have a price change, you know, you're going to see that you change your mix, your consumption mix of those two goods. Um, but the result of that effect is the result of two effects. The results of the price change is the result of two effects, uh, that substitution effect and the income effect. So with this, I'm going to walk through an example uh, where we change prices and we see substitution effect and income effect. So the first thing uh, is let's set up this economy. So this economy, you know, I went with a quantity of notepads, which are costing two bucks each, quantity of cafeteria meals, which cost five dollars each. Uh, I'm pulling this from this Krugman Wells question that's just kind of random. So I'll give a link to that video in the description. Um, so and we're going to have a price change and we're going to see uh, how people change their consumption bundle. They're going to change their mix of these two goods. Uh, and we're going to break down that change uh, into an income effect and a substitution effect. So first off, let's just kind of get this economy set up. Um, so uh, this person has a total income of $100 uh, and they have um, uh, so they have uh, notebooks that cost $2 each and then cafeteria meals that cost $5 each. So let's the first step to do is to put in the budget line. Um, so what's the budget line going to go from? Um, the first thing that we're going to do, give me one second. So the first thing to talk about is uh, when we draw this budget line, how do we draw the budget line? So this person has $100. Um, so let's do how we draw the budget line is we go to the two intersections of the two axes, right? So this axis, the vertical axis, is quantity of notepads. Um, so uh, for, for this point right here, um, like where does the budget line intersect the horizontal axis? Um, if this person were to spend zero dollars on cafeteria meals, you know, they were to buy zero cafeteria meals, what's the maximum number of, of notebooks that they could buy? And the answer is 50. Um, the, it's just simply their total income, which is 100, divided by uh, the cost of each notebook, which is 2, so that's going to be 50. So this intersection over here is going to be 50. What intersection do we take over here? Um, so on the horizontal axis, we have quantity of cafeteria meals. Each cafeteria meal costs $5, so what we do is we take the total income, which was 100, divided by $5 each. So if this person were to spend all of their money on cafeteria meals, they'd be able to buy cafeteria meals. So this budget line that I put in here uh, represents the c 
consumption mixes, you know, the mixes between notepads, the mix of uh, bundles between notepads and cafeteria meals that this person could purchase. For example, they could purchase at this point over here is zero cafeteria meals and 50 books, and then this point down here is zero notepads and uh, 20 cafeteria meals, and then some combination of the two. So, for example, over here might be something like uh, 10 cafeteria meals and um, 25 notepads, uh, and then also all of this area here. So with this budget line, you know, these are all the areas that you could afford. So uh, what, uh, what combination, what bundle is this person actually going to consume? Well, for that, you need an indifference curve. For that, you need an indifference curve. And lo and behold, here's an indifference curve. I just drew it in rather arbitrarily. Uh, so you got this indifference curve. And this indifference curve, the idea is that these consumption bundles, you know, like this point down here is some small amount of notepads and some large amount of cafeteria mills. Uh, delivers some quantity of utility. So let's say the utility is equal to like 100 utils or something. Um, all of these combinations give deliver the exact same quantity of utility. So this combination over here that gives uh, 50 notepads and some quantity of cafeteria mills, you know, something like 10 cafeteria mills, gives the exact same utility, happiness, uh, as this point over here, you know, that 100 utils. Um, and so the optimal consumption bill is the indifference curve that's the that's tangent uh, is the difference curve that's deepest into this area over here that's tangent to our budget line. So we're going to say our optimal consumption bundle is about at this point right here. And then we're going to call that consumption bundle pointy um, e sub one uh, for equilibrium sub one. Um, we're going to call it that because whatever. Uh, okay, so now let's think about a price change. The whole point of this video is uh, given a price change, you know, one changes their consumption bundle, uh, and that change um, can be broken down into two aspects. Let's uh, see what happens. So for cafeteria mills, let's say that they change the price of cafeteria mills. Let's say they change the price of cafeteria mills and they bring it down. Um, let's say they increase the price by by let's say a dollar. Let's say the price of cafeteria mills now goes up to a dollar to six bucks. So it uh, was at five bucks and went to six bucks. So what effect does that have? Um, well, the price of notepads hasn't changed. It's still two dollars. So if you were to spend this total income of a hundred dollars on notepads, you'd still get fifty. Uh, however, this intercept is going to change. Um, one hundred divided by the six dollars. You know, again, if someone were to spend that full one hundred dollars on meals, costing six bucks, they'd now be able to buy sixteen point six six meal plans. Um, so let's put that line in right now. Great, so here's the new budget line. Um, so we went, we were at this budget line, BL sub 1, and now we're at this new budget line uh, at, right here. And it's this is the budget line after a price increase. Given a price increase, you have an sh inward shift of the um, budget line reflecting a smaller set of consumption bundles available to this person. So now um, this person is able to do a mix of consumption bundles inside this little triangle. Um, so how much is this person going to consume? What what mix of notepads and cafeteria mills is this person going to consume? Point E is no longer available to them. They can't afford this point over here. This point is, you know, it's beyond their means. Their means is set by the frontier of their means. The border of their means is set by this new budget line. So we need our new indifference curve. And let's move that in right here. Um, let's say it's about there. That looks good. So our new optimal consumption bundle is going to be somewhere about there. So let's give it a new point. To summarize, we had our old consumption bundle over here. We had this price increase. And the price in increase led to this new budget line. Uh, and then given this new budget line, you know, there are only these consumption bundles are available to this person now. We have this new optimal consumption bundle over here, E2. Great. So that's what's happened. Uh, and you can see that the quantity consumed of cafeteria meals went from this QM sub 1, this QM1, to this new point here, QM2, that I'm calling QM2. Obviously, QM2 is less than QM1. That the quantity of meals uh, that you consume to uh, decrease. Uh, if the price of something goes up, you want to consume less of it, right? However, that uh, the effect uh, it can be broken down into two parts: the substitution effect and the income effect. 
And so how do we break down everything we've seen here, you know, the change from this to this point, into an income effect and a substitution effect? Um, so clearly Q, uh, the quantity of cafeteria meals consumed, decreased because the price went up. But how do we break that down into the two effects? Um, and once again, as a reminder, the first effect is that as the price of this good goes up, you're going to substitute a, away from it a bit. You're going to buy fewer cafeteria meals, so you could uh, buy more of these notepads. Uh, you'll notice E2 is slightly above E1. I probably could have drawn that to make that point clear, but uh, we're substituting away from cafeteria meals and into some notepads. Um, however, uh, the other effect is that because the price of cafeteria meals has gone up, this person's real income has gone down. Um, because the price of one of these goods that this person spends a fair amount of money on has gone up, they have a smaller purchasing power. They have less money to spend overall. So there's two effects going on. And so to differentiate the two effects, we're going to bring in this new line. So this new line is exactly parallel to the new budget line, BL sub 2. So remember, BL sub 2 is post the price change. And this line that we're moving in here, this dashed blue line, is exactly parallel to it, right? Um, so what is a parallel line? What does a line that's parallel to a one budget line mean? Well, you remember if you were to change the income of a person, that's going to shift their budget line in some way into a new line that's perfectly parallel. So if, the, if we started at BL sub 2 and we reduce this person's income, that means we're shifting in this way, and their budget line is going to be shifted in inward. However, the budget line stays at complete that stays parallel to the old budget line. Uh, the reason why is the slope of the budget line is equal to um, the, the price ratio, the, the ratio between prices of notepads and prices of um, cafeteria meals. So in this case it's the ratio of these prices is 2 over 5, uh, 2 over 6. So it's the slope here 2 over 6. Uh, happens to be a negative number but okay besides the point. So ratio uh, equivalent to the slope of this line. So we're going to shift this line outwards until it's parallel to the initial um, indifference curve. So let me first just kind of shift it in a way and then sh point out what that new point is going to be. Give me one second. Okay, so now that I've shifted the budget line, you know, I put this hypothetical budget line here that's exactly parallel to our new budget line. And I shift it up, up to the indifference curve. So we have the same relative prices as the new situation. But what we've done is we kind of hypothetically change this person's income such that they're on their initial indifference curve. So what that means is that when we go from point E1 here to this new hypothetical point, I'm calling it point E sub S because, I don't know, you know, you got to call it something. So the move from here, so Q, this is from this quantity of meals, Q sub M1, to this point here, Q sub S, that's equivalent to the substitution effect. Why is that so? Um, it's because we've basically kept um, relative incomes, you know, real incomes adjusted for prices, identical going from this point to this point. We know that's the case because it's still along the exact same indifference curve. You know, an indifference curve is any point along that, you're indifferent between points. So it's just as happy here as they are at E sub S. However, the one thing we changed is there, was a rel there were relative prices associated with our budget line sub 1. The relative prices when uh, notepads were 2 bucks and cafeteria meals were $5. And the only thing we changed, uh, keeping them on the indifference curve, are the relative prices such that now cafeteria meals are slightly more expensive. So moving from this point to this point uh, shows uh, how this person would substitute away from meals and into notepads given the change in price, assuming that we've kept their income identical. We've kept them on the exact same indifference curve. So from this point to this point is all substitution effect. So from Q sub M1 to Q sub S, this quantity is all substitution effect. Okay, next effect. We've kind of kept them on this hypothetical um, uh, identical old income, you know, where they're on this uh, the initial indifference curve. Uh, and now we have, all we've changed is the relative prices. Uh, and we know we've changed the relative prices. This, this line is absolutely parallel to this line, so the relative prices are the same. So the shift from E sub S to E sub 2 now 
is all the income effect. And the income effect, again, is just... Um, and the income effect is just how does this person change their income? Uh, how does this person change their consumption bundle given the change in income? Uh, remember, the only thing that we did here was change prices. So you're, you might be asking yourself, oh, wait, we did just change prices. How did, how did income change? Uh, well, income change because by increasing the price of cafeteria meals, this person's purchasing power has been reduced. Um, they, you know, given the same quantity of income, you know, because this, this budget line and this budget line still has a total income of $100. Um, because the price of meal of meals has gone up, this person's purchasing power, their ability to buy these combinations of notepads and meals has gone down. So in a real sense, you know, adjusted for prices, this person's income has changed from this point to this point. So the income effect is from QS to sub Q sub M1, M2. So from this point right here to this point right here. Okay, so the other thing is look at the direction that these effects have gone. So the substitution effect of an increase in price of cafeteria meals means a decrease in quantity demanded. And then the income effect of the reduced price, sorry, the income effect of the increased price of cafeteria meals also means reducing the quantity uh, consumed of cafeteria meals. And that makes sense. Cafeteria meals we'll assume is a normal good. And normal goods, if you increase, uh, if you decrease one's income, you expect people to buy fewer cafeteria meals. Uh, and then the other thing is, uh, as with any practically any good, if you increase the price of it, demand decreases. So in this case, the substitution effect and the income effect are both reinforcing. They both go in the same direction. And then the next example that uh, I already did an example that was a problem out of Kuben Wells, an inferior good example. Um, but I'm going to do another one with inferior goods to try to drive home those different points. Um, so I'll add at the end of this, hopefully this was helpful. I'm actually not sure it was. I was trying to be as clear as possible with these budget lines and the difference curves. But if you have any questions, let me know. Um, thanks, and have a good day. Bye.